Maddie Miles. Hello, Dom. Thank you <laughs> for joining me this morning. Absolutely. Honored to be here. Very excited. It has been a long time coming. I've been wanting to have you on the podcast for quite some time. And, you know, such is life. You and I are both going all over the place doing yeah. a million different things. <laughs> Truly. But I have really been diving into like the hormone health more for myself, just having blood work done three times last year and my hormone panel just not being great. Mm -hmm. And obviously you specialize in women's hormones, but you're like, when I think of like hormone, like people who like specialize in hormones, like Maddie Miles is the first person I think of. Peace Love Hormones is your brand. So mm -hmm. you've done a nice job of, of attaching <laughs> that to that. Yeah, I literally put hormones in the name. Yeah. <laughs> Smart. But before we get into the questions, because I've got a lot that I want to dive in, into, but I think for people to understand why you're so passionate about what you do, they need to understand who you are and your journey to getting to this point. Mm hmm yeah. Okay. So I'll talk about that. So um, hi, everyone. My name is Maddie Miles, and I am a clinical herbalist, and I studied integrative health sciences. So uh, meaning just outside of herbalism, which when you're studying herbalism as a student, uh, you learn about um, everything. You learn about anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, nutrition, um, pathology, like how disease forms in the body and how to fix it. Obviously, we focus mostly on a herbal approach, but in my integrative health sciences, studies, I learned a lot about a lot, let's just say that, and it allowed me to really decide, like, okay, what do I want to specialize in? Um, and ultimately, I decided, and it was a very easy decision for me, <laughs> but women's hormone and reproductive health, and and that's just, you know, um, a part of the equation, really, you know, our hormones play a role in nearly every process of the body, so uh, it really is, I, I studied just overall women's health. Why I got into that is because uh, from a very young age, I struggled with my health, like fifth grade-ish, so um, like 10, 11 years old, I started seeing my first medical specialist. At the time, I was a very anxious child, so I was going to see like a therapist, I was seeing a, psych um, a psychiatrist to see basically like what was wrong with me and what type of medication could I take to make me better. <laughs> that was the approach. So that started all around fifth grade and it was really like an up and downhill battle with my health from that point up until about 18 years old, my senior year of high school. So I was diagnosed with a bunch of different things. We'll just name some of them, depression, anxiety, anorexia, just like thrown a bunch of these labels essentially and then given pharmaceutical uh, interventions for it mostly medication so we got to this one point I was so overly medicated and so undereducated about my body mm -hmm. about just the body in general the body and the mind and and how things work and what they really need to thrive and to function properly and again I was very young so I mean also at the time I like my dreams for myself was I wanted to be an actress and a singer and maybe a fashion designer I think that was <laughs> that's what those were my interests um and my health very quickly became my full-time job as a young kid uh I pretty frequently missed school or at least missed like half of the day of school to go see different specialists uh, just many, many things, especially like my summers growing up at, towards high school and during high school, I was in full patient hospitalization programs for my eating disorder. So I missed out on a lot of summer activities and uh, I was really into sports. So I'd miss out on a lot of sports camps. Luckily, my coaches would always let me come and play um, as long as everything else was going well, come and play starting in the fall. So that was just my life. It was my life. And towards the end of my senior year, so I actually I graduated um, high school a semester early and I went and did an exchange program in Spain. So I was living with a host family. I was loving life, but I also relapsed pretty big time with my eating disorder. So I was sent back home for about a month. It was the same shindig. I was hooked up to feeding tubes in a hospital. I was back in dreary Chicago in, you know, end of winter. And that was like the first time that it really clicked in my head. And I saw just I like saw the future of my life. And in many of the programs that I was in, there were 40, 50 year old women in there still struggling with the same issues that started when they were in their teens. 
So I knew that it was possible to like stay in my health struggles and for that to be my life. And I did not want that to be my life. I wanted to go back to Spain in the immediate future at the time. I wanted to go to, I got into my university of choice. So I wanted to be able to go do that in August because my doctors and my parents at the time were like, you're not going to be able to live on your own um, if things keep going like this. So I, it just clicked and I was like, I want to get better. But everything that we've been doing the last eight or so years has not been working. Um, this is like a conversation I was having with my parents. So I didn't know about naturopathic medicine. I didn't know about herbal medicine. I didn't know that these forms of medicine have been along, around way longer than allopathic medicine, Western medicine, as we know it today. So my mom went back to the drawing board. She found this clinic outside of Chicago. I started going and seeing specialists, psychiatrists, nutritionists, naturopath doctors, these health professionals who, for the first time in my life, they didn't actually want to medicate me. That was not their first response. It was like, oh, like match symptom up to medication. It was, what are you eating? How much are you eating? Are you getting outside enough? Which is hard in Chicago and for most of the year. <laughs> but are you getting outside enough? And um, how are you sleeping? What are your friendships like? How, like how healthy are your friendships? What is your relationship like with your friends? Like it was such a, a mind-blowing approach to what I was feeling and struggling with for so long and I definitely was not on board right away I was like how will like what I eat for breakfast change how I feel you know like it was hard for me especially as a I, at the time I was I was 17 years old so I was like how is this really gonna be the fix so long story short without getting into like the next you know I mean the time up until now between my senior year of high school until now I went head deep into all holistic forms of healing and I studied nutrition in undergrad. I knew that I wanted to focus on herbalism postgrad. I didn't have any option to study herbal medicine at the University of Missouri, unfortunately. Um, great nutrition and dietetics program, though, if anyone wants to. <laughs> Is that, was that what your undergrad was? Yeah. Nutrition um, and dietetics. Okay. Yeah. And I, I just realized that, you know, that was not also business. I, I will say that, too. Business, um, even though I feel like it has prepared me negative amounts for it. <laughs> <laughs> Taxes and finances as an adult. Uh, that's all stuff I learned on myself. I, I feel like really my undergrad studies were just like this huge hodgepodge of things. I just studied like a bunch of different things that sounded cool. And then any anything that I've done post-grad has gone just like so much more like hyper-focused into whatever subject I want to learn, whether it's herbal medicine, functional lab testing, functional supplementation, etc. So that's, I mean, fast forward to now, I've just focused like the last eight plus years of my life on holistic healing and it did not happen overnight I even look at myself I, I reflect on who I was and what I was doing even like two years ago three years ago and I thought I was doing everything right then too and I'm like I've evolved so much since that point so my approach to health and wellness is you don't like just reach a point of okay I, I've reached it right like I'm I'm perfect I'm healthy I don't need to do anything else uh, while it's like a fine balance between you know knowing that there's always improvement to be made but also not obsessing over like I'm sick I'm not doing my best you know because I've definitely been there too like I I've gone through like all of the different phases of health and wellness I've gone through like the orthorexia and being super super um uh strict and obsessive over like what I was eating and how I was working out and that's not healthy either even though I was eating enough food which was a great improvement from my eating disorder days when I was malnourished and underweight I was still so obsessive and so stressed about every single thing that I did and every single thing that I consumed and ate um, which isn't healthy either so I'm at this point now in my life and I've been here for the last few years where I'm like I'm balanced, but I know that there is still more to learn. Number one, we're still learning so much about the human body and about the human brain. Um, so I am just really excited to be a part of that research in any capacity and to be able to share that research with people and to incorporate it into my own practice. But I also feel really great where I'm at right now. <laughs> and I don't wake up every single day trying to find things that are wrong with me to fix, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's such a motivating story for me to hear because I haven't had the same journey as you but definitely like the orthorexia thing definitely resonates with me because you know what fitness health all these things are supposed to amplify our quality of life they're not supposed to take away from them mm -hmm. and when you focus so much on 
that, like the thing that you're doing, it takes away from, you know, your presence with other people, um, your enjoyment of life. Like you're so focused on like not messing up or being strict. So I think like finding a way to like detach from that, like strictness or that obsessiveness yet still enjoy taking care of yourself in a way that, you know, serves your purpose and your ambitions in life. It seems like you've sort of found a way to find, you know, synergy and, and mm -hmm. harmon harmony within that. So what do you think were those like connecting pieces of, you know, taking care of your health yet also not being so strict and so obsessive that you're that person that nobody wants to hang out, <laughs> hang out with on a Friday night. Yeah. It, uh, gosh. I mean, there was no like real specific thing that I did or, or moment that I remember where it just like was more balanced. It took years for me to get to that. And I, I can think of a bunch of micro moments or maybe they're, they were, they felt macro in the moment. But for example, I was vegan, um, or plant-based. I know that kind of irks some vegans when people say, I used to be vegan. They're like, well, you're not vegan. Um, so I was plant-based <laughs> for six years and I started eating animal proteins again two years ago. And that really helped. I mean, on a, on a physiological level, it really helped me. It nourished my brain in ways that my brain was not being nourished, which just helped with with everything i mean the way that i perceived my life and things going on in my life it just helped with my perspective my perception and uh just literally how my brain was functioning mm. and it supported my nervous system it supported my hormones and my menstrual cycle and just helped to to rebalance my body in ways that i really needed to be rebalanced mm. after so many years of uh of being plant-based again it didn't happen overnight it wasn't like oh i ate a, a bite of fish and now all of a sudden i'm balanced so it really took like six to 12 months of really nourishing on a deep deep cellular level and that is a really um a standout pivotal moment in my life especially in the last you know handful of years that have really helped me to become more healthy, more balanced and more neutral. And also to, you know, stay on the topic of veganism. I, I had identified so much with being vegan and I really started to dissect that. Why am I so connected to a way of eating? And it, it was something that was very, very personal and internal because I, didn't push veganism on anyone else. So that was another thing I started to like, hmm, you know, I'm like a very smart, conscious woman. And I, over time, I've become more conscious and more grounded and uh, more like stoic in ways. And, you know, I've really kind of questioned my thoughts, my actions. I've questioned just humanity as a whole and, and why we're here. And so during that process, I was just questioning why am I so attached to something that clearly I don't believe in enough because I'm not promoting it to other people and I'm not pushing other people to be vegan. And I had my quirks, don't get me wrong. I mean, my boyfriend Braxton will, will tell people that, you know, when we first started dating, I told him like I didn't want him to cook meat in, in our house, you know, or in my, it, we lived together now, we didn't live together then. I was like, I don't want meat to be cooked and on my pots and pans. Um, and I was, you know, cause we, from the very get go, I've, talked about like marriage and children I was like I don't want our children to eat it and then I was like okay maybe that's not true um so anyway just you know but beyond that like I didn't care that he ate meat in fact I wanted him to because I knew I was like you need it you know so anyway I started to question why am I so attached to veganism why am I so attached to uh I was a big runner for a long time so it's like why am I so attached to just running every single day to in my head if I didn't run that day I was like I wasn't, um, I wasn't productive. Mm. So I was so attached to different things that really didn't matter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I just started to question that. And it helped me to, uh, again, getting outside of like veganism, getting outside of working out and running, really just apply that to different areas of my life. And, you know, realize too that as humans, we should be really weary of identifying too much with one thing because as humans, we're constantly changing and evolving. Mm -hmm. And especially as women where we are really, really changing on a physiological level every single month throughout the month because of our hormones, because of our other biomarkers that are changing, 
our neurology, our physio- physiology are all changing throughout our cycle. And we can get into men too about how yeah. y'all cycle on a 24 hour um, schedule, but still we should be like paying attention to these rhythms and we shouldn't just identify with something so hardcore, whether it's veganism or it's being a carnivore or it's being keto or like all of these things. I just realized that people, I mean, humans, we need to identify to like relate to something, you know, and people often go to the extremes with diet and exercise. It Mm. just seems to be for whatever reason, like that's what we keep coming back to Mm. is how can we get so particular and so obsessive and have so much control over what we are doing to our bodies. It almost like, you know, and I'm speaking more so from a perspective of my eating disorder. Cause again, I've been dealing with the, the strictness obsessiveness for a long time for more of my life than not. And it's just, it, it's like so many other crazy things are going on in our life that we don't have control over. What's like one or two things that we can control? It's our body, what we eat, you know? And and it goes on both ends. Like I you know, was in eating disorder recovery programs with people who, uh, anorexia and under eating wasn't their, their struggle. It was bulimia or it was um, overeating, right? And so... Anyway, I've realized that humans, it's its a way to cope with everything else going on in our world. Um, so anyway, I, I am not by any means saying like I'm this perfect, very balanced human being, but I know myself now. I know like, okay, when I get stressed or anxious or when I feel like overwhelmed by the world because the world is overwhelming and we're realizing that more as we grow up and are adults and we're not naive to everything like we were when we were kids. What is our initial response to cope with anxiety? Is it obsessively working out? Is it being super nitpicky over our food? Um, And maybe it has nothing to do with stress and coping with anxiety. Maybe it's just, do you feel lost? Are you still searching for your purpose? And so you think that your purpose is like how you eat and like being really nitpicky about how you eat and how you work out because I just don't believe as humans that's what we're put on this earth to do. Again, we're constantly changing. We're constantly evolving. So I'm always weary, especially nowadays, because I've had my long, long experience with being so uh, like gung-ho, really all for something. I'm just very like I try to be as balanced and as neutral as possible. So going back to Mm -hmm. answering your question, I just know that as humans, we're constantly changing on like a micro and a macro level. So you know, I always just kind of watch nowadays people on social media get so for like one way, of whether it's eating or it's working out. I've seen so many people, whether they're practitioners or not, they're just like health influencers that are like, I am raw. Like I only eat raw <laughs> meat. I only eat raw eggs, like dr- raw milk. Like, and if you don't, basically you're like, you're a terrible person. Yep. And I'm like, I am happy that that works for you, but yep. it, that may not work for everyone. And also you're putting yourself into this box because if in a year from now, two years from now, et cetera, if that's no longer working for you, all these people just know you for that, you know, and humans, especially the ones who are still working on their internal healing are going to be really upset with you if you stop doing that, you know, because they're identifying with you doing something. So anyway, that's a long way of answering your question, but it's just such a fascinating topic to me because I've been on both sides of it. And it's really interesting now because I have a lot of compassion for people who feel like they need to identify with something. I I get it, right? I get like the fundamental like human need to want to identify with something. Um, And it's easier to do that than to be like balanced. But I mean, gosh, I I don't know exactly how I found my way to where I am today, but I do feel very, very balanced. Um, And just like, you know, Go with the flow is my mentality now, which is really nice uh, after so many years of forcing myself to do things, even if I didn't have the energy to do it. Hmm. Well, from the outside looking in, you can see that you're very open and you're very vulnerable and you're very honest about your journey. You don't hide anything like, yeah, I've been vegan. Like, I eat meat. I did this. I did that. I tried this. I tried that. This worked. This didn't work. And that's the beauty of health is if one thing doesn't work for you because it's bio individuality, you just go and, and you try something else. Like, mm-hmm. I'll be honest, I'm really sick of like the carnivore, like low carb keto community because I was in that for a while. I was mm-hmm. all, you know, don't eat vegetables, like carbs <laughs> are bad, like Crazy. intermittent fast all day, mm-hmm. like do all these things. And now I'm just like, like, 
No, like, and I, but I've on, been on the opposite end of the spectrum where I did, I did a month vegan. <laughs> that, was, that was all I could handle. And I felt like yeah. my, my body was failing me. Yeah. Um, so I was like, yeah, you know, eat them, eat the meat, eat mm-hmm. the animal products, but you can also like eat the vegetables and eat the fruit and do all right. these other things. And what I really appreciate about you as well is like, you have a company and you have a like that where you sell products, you sell tinctures, you sell like herb, herbalism, herbalist products, herbal tinctures, herbal yeah. tinctures. <laughs> but you haven't mentioned any of that yet because you've been mm-hmm. mentioning the lifestyle pieces, the food, the those are like the biggest drivers, right? And so what I appreciate about your content, even though you know I'm not necessarily looking to you know l- dive deep into you know women's health and hormones. However, I have learned a ton from your page because I do think I don't have a girlfriend right now, but when, (laughs) when that, when, when that time comes, I feel like I'll better understand, Oh, like, you know, women, they operate on like a a 30 day cycle versus men on a 24 hour cycle. Mm -hmm. Right. So I always appreciate how you look at things from like a holistic lens. You talk about like the, the prime movers and the needle movers before like, Hey, like these herbal tinctures, they're great additions. Mm -hmm. They're like the, the, fuel on the fire of doing what is like the most important so yeah before people you've mentioned a couple things but before people get into like the herbal tinctures and we're gonna like we'll we'll get into the herbalism and and some some of the herbs that you have seen really help people thrive Mm -hmm. in their lives and have healthy hormones but what are those like prime movers for you those pillars in your life that are non-negotiables that you know, help move the needle as far as possible, as far as possible without, you know, yeah. the the extra things. Yes. So I'm, I love everything that you just said. There's a reason why supplements are called supplements, right? They're not supposed to. In fact, not only are they not supposed to, they can't supplement a bad lifestyle if someone's not sleeping well, if someone's super high stress and someone's eating fast food all the time. Like you can take the best of the herbs and the best of the functional supplements and it's really not going to move the needle too much if you're not taking care of yourself and all the other ways that come first. Like Mm. let's get the low hanging fruit first, you know? Um, So, and then another uh, little note, side note about my page and I do focus heavily on women's health for sure. I'm a woman. It makes a lot of sense. (laughs) And I struggled with my hormone health for so long because I was so sick. But a lot of the things I talk about are applicable to men too, you know? And so, because I talk a lot about exactly what you said, lifestyle. So all the things that come first and or just that are are happening at the same time as you are taking herbal medicine or supplementation or something to to support you even further. So when it comes to just like overall health and well-being, again, this is for both women and for men, um, sleep is number one. So many people are undersleeping and are sacrificing sleep for working out. I did this for a very long time too, so I get it. And I especially sympathize with the the obsession and just the uh, we can get we can be so hard on ourselves, mm-hmm. you know? And I I get it. So um really sleep is number one whenever I see someone because I do have a, a practice, it's both in person and, and virtual. I'm definitely taking a step back a little bit because I'm starting up school again, and um, also I have two companies, so <laughs> two herbal companies, so I'm, I'm not seeing people as much. But when I do, or if I'm just talking to someone who I'm friends with or family, I always go to sleep first. How are you sleeping? That is the absolute number one most important. How are you sleeping? The next is stress. I can pretty much guess that most people that I talk to are really chronically stressed, and I hear a lot of people say, oh, I'm not stressed. But that's because they're so used to feeling stress that they become used to that feeling of high cortisol and the adrenaline. Most of us are just, we're running on high stress fumes for sure. And not doing enough things to regulate after a stressful event. So it's like we're staying in this just low hum of stress all day long and we aren't really able to like fully get out of it. So next would be stress. And then um, three is nutrition. Again, like aside from sleep, all of these are of equal importance. Not one is more important than the other. But next would be nutrition. Because we're living more high stress lifestyles, a lot of us are not working from home. We're working in offices, although COVID kind of changed that. But a lot of people are still working 
away from home and aren't in their kitchen to make healthy meals for themselves. By the time they get home from work and take care of themselves through a workout or something, they don't have a lot of time to meal prep for the next day. So a lot of people are eating out as well and or just don't know how to properly nourish themselves if they are cooking at home because number one, unless you went to school for nutrition, you're not you that didn't have any classes on how to nourish yourselves. And I wish that we did. I wish that was a part of the curriculum. I feel like we take so many silly classes in middle school through high school, honestly through undergrad too. It's just like a lot of silly non nonsensical classes and then any th- any postgrad studies get much more in depth. And then just personal research too and and learning yourself is super important. So nutrition um and then another thing I want to say about nutrition is there's so much information and noise on social media. And again, you know, this person is saying you should be a carnivore. Oh, he's a medical doctor, too. Like, maybe we should trust him, you know, although not to say any names, um, but <laughs> he's no longer car- carnivore anyway. You know, like he's moved away from that. So um, and then this person is uh, saying he looks amazing. He's super healthy and he's eating all raw meat and raw egg yolks and raw milk. So does that mean I need to do that? Well, this person looks super healthy and they're vegan, you know, so there's like all this noise about nutrition as well from pe- majority of people who don't actually have the expertise to really talk about nutrition and the depth that they're talking about nutrition. So there's so much confusion. So even if you are working from home and you have your own kitchen that you're, you know, at to make all three meals every single day, there's a lot of confusion on what to actually cook yourself, how to make a balanced meal and a, a nutritious meal. Um, so we, we get into nutrition as well. So sleep, stress, nutrition. Um, and then for me, a big one for when I'm talking about holistic health and well-being, is getting outside more. I I want everyone listening to really like reflect over the next day or two how much time you're actually spending outside. Most people are spending less than 30 minutes outside. If you have a dog, it's a little bit different because you are hopefully taking your dog on walks. I guess if you have a backyard, you could just let the dog out in the backyard. Most people are not getting outside enough. And I notice on the days, for example, today, it's raining in Austin, Texas. I mean, it's only... 11 a.m. right now, but I haven't been outside much so far today. I mean, I was, I opened up our, our garage when I was doing some weights this morning, so I was getting some fresh air and, and fresh light, but I just always feel a little bit more tired and groggy, and so on those type of days, I always just, my heart goes out to the people who don't get enough outdoor time because they're missing an easy, free opportunity to boost their cognitive health, their mood, to boost their physiological health and their hormones, and to support their blood glucose levels throughout the day, and to support their insulin, so it's just an easy, free way to support yourself is just getting outside more, even if you live in a city, like still get outside. I know that air is not as clean as if uh, you lived out in the countryside, but still you're getting outside and uh, you're getting natural light, which is very important. Again, if it's not sunny, even if it's cloudy, you're still getting natural light and those natural UVs. It's, it's, you need to spend a little bit more time outside than if it were sunny, but you're still reaping those benefits. So more outdoor time. The weekends too, um, I have a lot of uh, friends who live in New York City and they'll just go hiking on the weekends and really submerse themselves in nature go barefoot or wear barefoot grounding shoes. So um, there are ways to definitely to regulate every single week if you can't go hiking every single day. Maybe it's on the weekend. So getting outside more, 110% getting outside more. And then is there anything else I want to mention before I get into herbalism? (laughs) I think I got all the, oh, well, I do want to say community and having healthy relationships in your life. Uh, What I think that saying goes, you know, you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Also, Uh, This is generally speaking, this doesn't apply to every single person, but usually when you're with a group of people, you will match the energy of like the lowest vibrational person. Um, I heard that and I was I was really intrigued by that. Uh, Again, I try my best to like be aware of that now if someone like is in a really bad mood or maybe they're just not a very bubbly person. I'm like, all right, you know, energy shield uh, around that and, and try to not pick that up. So 
really having healthy relationships in your life and surrounding yourself with people who inspire you. And that doesn't mean they have to be this mega millionaire entrepreneur. They can inspire you for different reasons. You know, maybe that person is just like a very kind and giving person. That's inspirational. Mm. Or maybe that person loves to be outside. will literally do everything outside, whether it's working or it's working out or it's hanging out with people and spending time with other humans. Like everything is always outside. Like, that's inspirational, right? Because that person seems very connected to nature. So people can be inspirational for different things and just having people in your life that are that are inspirational to you and loving and kind people. So next uh, would be herbal medicine and functional supplementation. I love herbs. Herbs are so powerful. They're the oldest form of healthcare that we have. So most of these herbs, we have medical literature from whether it's Ayurvedic medicine or um, Egyptian medicine, African medicine, we have proof that these herbs, many of these herbs have been used for 6,000 years or longer. And it's just crazy to me that people still aren't using herbs and using herbs to their medi- er, using herbal medicine to their advantage. Why do you think that is? So I think it's one of two reasons. I think that number one, um, people just don't know, perhaps. And number two, that there's a lot of misinformation out there. And when Big Pharma sees something natural that has minimal side effects, which most herbs fall under that that category, not all herbs, but most, that they can't make money off of, they're going to demonize it. That's just how it it works. So um, that's why I loved my studies and understanding how to decipher research a lot of people post research on on like their post on on their reel and it makes them look very smart but you're also like oh you just posted like a screenshot of one little thing you know like you didn't get into all of the variables of that research or really how that research went you know so um being able to decipher research and also like track like you know is there any bias in this like who funded this um most research studies, the good ones, will include a little blurb of like, was there any conflict of interest? Who was funding this? Did they have any affiliation, etc. So um, I, I think there's just a lot of misinformation out there. As so many people, I don't see like a traditional allopathic physician at this point in my life. I, I see a naturopathic doctor for my my visits. Uh, in my checkups, but most medical doctors, I'm hearing stories from a lot of people that I connect with in real life on social media as well, who say that their doctor tells them, advises them not to use specific herbs because they're dangerous, but then will prescribe hormonal birth control or another medication that has a crazy list of side effects, sometimes including death as well, like blood clots, which could also cause death. And, um, and, you know, I don't know if it's because they're in a white coat or like what it is, but psychologically humans are just like, we'll, we'll trust anything that the doctor says. Again, I think that it's changing now. I think that uh, the last few years have really given a lot more power back to the people and like autonomy over our bodies, how they work, how we feel. And I've just noticed I'm like humans are feeling a little bit more confident and powerful, uh, you know, and obviously... That's like looking at it from a big picture. Um, And we also live in Austin, Texas. So different breed over here, (laughs) different culture. But yeah, I think it's just not knowing. We, You know, again, if you're not going to school for this stuff, it's like, well, I don't really know about all of the herbs that are out there that could help me. And, And then there's a lot of confusion because there are some research studies that say that maybe this herb is bad and... It, it really irks me because a lot of those studies are using standardized extracts of herbs, which are not the same as uh, how nature intended us for to consume that that specific plant. Sometimes they're using the wrong parts of the plant um, just because we'll use ashwagandha, for example. Ashwagandha is a very powerful plant, but we use the root. We don't use the leaves. So, um, you know, if we're looking at a study and it's saying, oh, well, ashwagandha caused all of these negative side effects in these people. It's like, well, you use the leaves, you know. Mm. No form of medicine throughout the history of time has said to use the leaves. You know, that's just like one example. Or maybe they used a standardized extract, which means that they took one specific chemical constituent out of the hundreds or even thousands in that root of the plant. And they're like, oh, that specific chemical constituent is beneficial. Mm. So we're going to take just that. We're going to extract that. We're going to highly concentrate it. And then we're going to give big doses to rats. 
and then see what happens. And like, obviously, that's probably not going to be a good that's not going to elicit a good reaction. <laughs> you know, anything done to the excess in general is inherently not good uh, for the human body, mind or soul. Um, but especially when we're talking about chemical constituents that have a medicinal and physiological impact on the body, if you're mega dosing it and you're not having all of the other wonderful chemical constituents that it's supposed to have with it to help balance and neutralize the effects, then you're going to get a poor effect. And I always explain like a little um, analogy I, I always give people for that specific situation with like standardized extracts and such. And some standardized extracts are good, like berberine, for example. Mm -hmm. Berberine is not a plant, right? Like, it's a chemical constituent that is ex it's extracted. I'm from. thinking that right now, actually. Yeah, berberine. so it's always bad, mm -hmm. right? But, like, it's not always good. And, in fact, most of the time, think of, like, a band, right? Like, you could be listening to an awesome singer, and you're like, ooh, like, this singer sounds amazing. But then you add the bassist and the guitarist and the pianist and the drummer, and then it sounds complete, you know? You're like, oh, this sounds like a beautiful song. Not that the singer didn't sound great by himself, herself, or perhaps like just the acoustic version sounded great, but all together it just sounds complete to my ears. It's the same thing with herbs. It's like you could extract the medicinal compound from a plant and you can, you know, mega dose it. Maybe sometimes that has a good effect, but it's going to work better if it has all of its teammates with it you know because again those chemical constituents work together to make sure that there's not such like a push or pull action most medications have a very one way of working it's like a push or pull herbalism is different in that it's much more of like a neutralizing effect again unless you are struggling with something very acute and you're very sick and in the acute term you want to take larger doses of herbs i work with herbs in a way where you take smaller not like micro doses but like smaller doses over longer periods of time mm. to let it build up within your body and there's so many different herbs to work with it really just depends on so many things i mean <laughs> a man woman what age are you what are you struggling with what are your goals or do you just want overall like tonifying of your systems do you need support with again like an acute illness that is going on so it really just depends on like what's needed but you know there are so many herbs and I know you want to talk about like men's hormones and hmm. fertility, so we can talk about some herbs for that if you would like. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate you like laying the groundwork yeah. for like how herbalism works in general. Because that was a good lesson for me as well. Because mm -hmm. I, I know I'm a firm believer in like naturopath, like nat I go to see a naturopathic doctor as well. Like Love it. All of all the things, but I still don't really I like promote it, but I don't really understand it. So that was a very that was a good like <laughs> 101 crash course in it yeah um so in my person in my own personal journey i have I, I never got blood work done until last year so uh, i was 24 and at the time i was running a lot it's you know, kind of same thing same thing as you were but um i was running a lot i was training for marathons and i got my um blood work back and i was like man my, my hormone pan panel was was really bad like my mm -hmm. testosterone was 99 like yeah double that is, for anybody yeah. who doesn't understand that is not good really my free testosterone was like 7.6 or something so very very low as well um and those aren't the only like testosterone is not the only you know thing that we should be looking at but it's obviously one that most the people are most familiar with and mm -hmm. that's tested for um often so i'm curious what are some of the other hormones that we should be looking at you know you know what is a horm what what is a hormone in general like we hear that but like you know what are the what are hormones why are they important and you know for men i think there's this like it makes me so sad to see like in society and i was this person myself too it's just like always tired always fatigued always groggy like not energetic not like exuberant about life and as i've prioritized like my hormone function like all those things have gotten better so that was a loaded question right there but um <laughs> hopefully we can navigate through that so you asked what other hormones should be tested a full thyroid panel is very important mm, that was another one that i i did and it was again also shot yeah well it makes sense especially if you're i mean all of these things work together mm. so when it comes to running labs again because the body is a system like that's working all together it's important to just get a, a really well-rounded picture of what's going on um and you don't need to run because 
these labs get expensive. So you don't need to run these labs. Like, yeah. unless again, I mean, you went through something really, really serious, cardiac arrest. So like you went through something very serious and, yeah. you know, if you're going through something like that, for example, like, yeah, maybe during that time you need to get labs tested more frequently. Outside of that, though, I say like annual, like kind of just run a panel and see what's going on. Unless you're just like totally like I feel great, like I don't need anything. But I feel like annually, especially after age like 35 is probably really smart. So um, full thyroid panel, I would do um, testosterone, estrogen, uh, I mean, a full hormone panel, including for men as well, because y'all have as well estrogen as well. So Not as much. What's the role of estrogen for men? Um, the role of estrogen for men, well, number one, it can be converted to testosterone and testosterone can be converted back into estrogen. Hmm. In terms of like the function of estrogen for y'all, um, that's a really great question because for women, we have testosterone to much lower amounts. For us, testosterone is this, it, it's mostly produced around ovulation, number one. And it's this uh, like energizing hormone. It helps with confidence and feeling sexy and, you know, kind of similar things to for men as well, you know. Um, and so, and then estrogen and progesterone as well are like the two key female hormones that just help support our physiological processes. Now, estrogen in men, um, again, it's not a good thing to have high estrogen. So I don't want anyone leaving this podcast being like, oh, I need to check my estrogen levels and make sure that they're high. In fact, you want to make sure that they're actually on the lower end for men. Um, but I feel like it's probably best that I don't comment fully on that because I I'm not an expert in that realm. And I also am, this is actually the first time that I'm really talking about men's health on a podcast. Mm. I talk about men's health to, of course, with my boyfriend all the time and with my dad and my brother, because I'm trying to get them to care about their health a little bit more. Um, but I've actually had guys on my podcast talk about men's health because I'm like, tell me what it's like living in your body, yeah. you know? Um, and not that like I can't talk about men's health, but I sometimes it does uh like irk me a little bit when guys talk about women's health <laughs> so i'm like i don't want anyone to like listen to this and be annoyed that i'm talking about men's health um because again i'm not i'm not a male and i don't mm -hmm. live in your body i don't understand the experience of having my number one having high testosterone and having that really cycle on a 24 hour uh 24 hour loop mm. i mostly am focused on estrogen and progesterone for my body and those are like the markers of my hormone health and then testosterone to healthy amounts around ovulation mm. um and i i get those you know benefits of testosterone around sure. ovulation but it's not like to how you guys feel it with right. your levels but i can kind of understand yeah. of like oh i feel like more energized and i okay. feel like a lot more confident and just like sexy, you know, yeah. around ovulation. And that's thanks to higher levels of estrogen and testosterone. Um, so I can kind of like understand how maybe you guys would feel a little bit. So, I mean, let me tell me if I'm wrong or not, but are the things that you do as a woman to, you know, enhance your progesterone and estrogen, like, are they similar? Can men do similar things that mm -hmm. will instead raise their testosterone absolutely so going back to stress and sleep um and usually those go hand in hand so lowering stress for women will help to make sure that we're not like overproducing cortisol and therefore have higher levels of inflammation and have higher levels of estrogen and therefore like whether or not we have lower levels of progesterone we, that ratio between estrogen and progesterone is off same for men so which is I feel like not talked about as much. It's it's being talked about more that like women should uh, reduce their stress levels to support their hormones, prevent PMS, support fertility. It's not talked about enough. And correct me if I'm wrong, because maybe I'm just not in this algorithm of social media. I haven't seen it be talked about a lot for men to actually reduce their stress. Mm. I've seen kind of the opposite of like, guys, you should be waking up at five in the morning, you know, doing your first workout of the day. And like, you know, kind of just like, power through in the more like, especially through the morning i even remember like huberman's podcast i was like out of curiosity i was like how is he like setting up his morning routine and i was thinking about it more so in terms of women's health because a lot of women listen to huberman and just follow blindly what he says and he's he's brilliant don't get me wrong he's brilliant but i was like i wonder if you know 
his morning routine is something that women should be following. <laughs> and he was, he usually fast and, and he'll work out fasted or he'll drink caffeine. So he'll drink caffeine on an empty stomach and work out and then not eat until like 11 or noon. Cortisol, cortisol, cortisol. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like, I'm genuinely curious, you know, and that's like a question that I have. Like, I have a ton of questions, by the way. Like, I am not this know-it-all and we should always be asking questions as humans. But like, is that really good for men? Because, you know, yes, your your testosterone is highest in the morning. Um, and so you have more energy, but do you need to add more fuel to the fire then by having caffeine on an empty stomach? And just because you feel great, again, feeling great could just be running high on cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline. So, you know, do, is that a good thing? I don't mm. think so. And so for women's health, I always say, you know, and this isn't just me, this is just, we have research to to prove the efficacy of eating breakfast within 30 to 60 minutes of waking up to make sure that cortisol doesn't get too high because then that will just negatively impact other things throughout the day, such mm. as our blood sugar and our insulin, our estrogen, progesterone, especially when done in like the long term. So I'm like genuinely curious because I do see a lot of guys, I'm on Twitter and I follow a lot of men there. It's funny. I gotta get Twitter? on. I gotta get on Twitter. Everyone in Austin is on Twitter. Like I came from Philly. Like nobody's on Twitter. Okay. Really? Yeah. I I just like in fairness, I just started my Twitter back up like a month or so ago, and I don't. It's so it's so funny to me because my algorithm on Twitter is pretty much all men. <laughs> it's the only platform I'm on where it's like that. But it's nice because I've gotten a lot of insight into like what guys are doing, and um. You know, I had Soul Bra for anyone who's familiar with Great it. episode, by the way. Thank Mitt, you. That was, that was, I just listened to that. Mm -hmm. So good. Well, I, I really liked, I mean, everything that he said, I was like, this is just what I say for women's health. You know, a lot of it translate translates over. So hence why, you know, sl sleep and stress are so important when it comes to both women and men's health. But he's one, I mean, I've noticed like, you know, don't get me wrong. I think we all have our quirks and we all have things that we really <laughs> identify with. But he eats breakfast. He doesn't go and fast until noon and drink caffeine on an empty stomach. I think some days he actually stays away from caffeine. So I don't know. I mean, going back to Huberman, like, I think he's brilliant. But also, I think a lot of people get so into, like, the biohacking world. And they're like, here's how to optimize pro productivity. But at the expense of what? You know, mm. at the expense of your nervous system? Like, how is your sperm count and your sperm motility and your testosterone levels going to look after a few months of doing that? Waking up every every morning really, really early, sacrificing your sleep so that you can wake up early. I, side note, this just popped into my brain. Uh, this is the Austin community. For anyone who doesn't live in Austin, here's a little taste into Austin. Uh Braxton was with a few friends the other day and one of them said that he is a part of this group now where they're trying to sleep less because apparently the human body doesn't need as much sleep. And so I'm over here like I'm intrigued by that because every single thing that I've learned and researched and have experienced to be true is the exact opposite of that. And so he's a part of this group that's like a, a group worldwide that are sleeping now like two hours a night and ho with the hope and intention of getting to no hours of sleep. And, you know, you just kind of got to laugh at some of these things because you're like, I release control. I can't, you know, help every single person in the world, you know, in a few months if, you're, if your health is struggling, like, come and see me. But I'm also like, there's part of me, too, that's like the researcher in me is like, can I study? <laughs> <laughs> can we, like, run some labs on you? I'm genuinely curious. Um, and, it, you know. I, I wouldn't want like a woman to test that out because very quickly we would know like, okay, your, your ovulation's delayed, you're not cycling and, or your periods are super heavy and painful. Like we would know pretty quickly, but for men, like aside from fatigue and moodiness, um, we'd probably want to like run some laps to really see what's going on. And like, yeah, how are your testosterone levels? Testosterone is really like the most important mm. sex steroid hormone for men. Um, but it's important to test as well, like your cortisol. It's important to test omega-3 and omega-6 to see what the inflammation um, balance is like in your body. Um, and then you can get super like into uh, like mega, mega functional lab testing, you know, and like test your biological age. I actually have never done that before. I'm interested in doing it, but it's also like not at the top of my like priority list. Um, but there are a ton of labs. That being said, I'm 
forgetting his name. I just was talking about him the other day. He's located in Austin. I th- in- believe he's like a medical doctor who gave up his license um, during like COVID to be able to talk more about holistic health. But he has a full panel that I think is anywhere from five hundred to a thousand dollars that does a lot of like the biological um, testing and uh, genetic testing. And I'm forget. Do you is this ringing a bell for you? He's really he's he's a little bit older. He's always wearing the red light glasses. On I'm like, what is his name? Oh uh, gosh, I was just talking about him another day. Anyway, um, is he like a very well known yeah, guy? He's is very it, well known. Is it Dave Asprey? Yeah, I think it's Dave Asprey. Yeah, I think it's Dave Asprey. Is Dave okay. Asprey was he a medical doctor before then? I think so. Dave Asprey's like the father of biohacking. Right. It's he's the one who found like founded like bulletproof coffee. Yeah. You know, like, oh. I it's it's him. There's also another like in my mind, I always put Dave and this guy together, but they're not they're different humans. <laughs> like, well, in my mind, I sometimes just like mesh them together. Okay. Um but anyway, he does like a a full like panel that you know he recommends you get once a year and i have a few friends that have done that so gary brecca i have never heard of that guy before so it wasn't him (laughs) never mind um but i will say too like you know on the note of like testing and men's health and um just just that whole realm is i've noticed a lot of guys are very like strict about certain things and when it comes to their health and wellness do you Hundred percent. I've I've been that I've been that person yeah. myself. Still am in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'm like, am I like, okay? Well, I'm glad you say that because I I've questioned like, is this because I have like a much more balanced like soft feminine approach now, or is this like really extreme? Um, yeah, and I see that a lot on it. it Twitter is interesting. Like, get on Twitter and see what you think about it because again, like, I see guys who in some ways have very balanced approaches who are like, get into bed early, sleep, you know, take care of your stress. And like take some of these herbs, and then it's like eat ten raw egg yolks though, and drink all this raw milk, and dose yourself with methylene blue. And I'm like, oh my gosh! And like some of these supplement stacks that some of these guys take that I follow on Twitter, I don't even know if I follow them. I don't know how the Twitter algorithm works. I see their post all the time though. Um, the supplement stack is insane, and I'm just like, that's just not like, what is the intention? Obviously, maybe this person has a different intention. Maybe he's a bodybuilder. I didn't look that much into it. But some of it's just pretty wild. It's very intriguing to me. What are some of the things, lifestyle-wise, food-wise, and herbalism-wise, that men can do to boost testosterone? Sleep more. Like, get really, really great sleep every single night. The earlier you can get into bed before midnight, the better. I know there's that whole debate on like the night owls or not. I don't believe that there's such thing as night owls. My boyfriend Braxton begs to differ because he feels, you know, he loves staying up late, but then he doesn't feel good the next day. So it's like, again, maybe you like to stay up a little late. It's a little fun. <laughs> Brings out your inner child, but uh, you don't feel great the next day. So definitely getting into bed early and getting a good amount of sleep every single night. Um, like for men, I've, I know it's a little bit less that y'all can get away with in terms of sleep than women, but still, like, just sleep enough, you know? Like, I don't even want to, like, throw out a number. Sleep at least seven hours. I'll just say that for anyone who I likes was about the number. To, I was about to say, <laughs> what is enough? As you were like, I'm not going to throw out a number. Okay. I was like, because sometimes you just get weird because people get so, like, all right, well, I heard this one number on this one podcast, and now I have to do it. It's like, just sleep. You know your body the best. But is that so? I wore a whoop for a long time, and it was like, I might be in bed for seven hours. I might only have six hours or less of actual like time asleep, Mm -hmm. right? So when you say seven hours, is that like seven hours of being asleep or seven hours in bed? Um, that would be of actually be like shut eye Mm -hmm. being asleep. So really like eight hours in bed. Yeah. Uh, Does it take you long to fall asleep? How long does it take you to fall asleep? Uh, It doesn't. It doesn't. But I I wake up frequently throughout Mm -hmm. throughout the night. One, I think, is I drink too much, so I usually have to pee, like, twice throughout the night. Um, Can I give you a little tip for that? Please. Just really, like, so what time do you finish eating dinner? Uh, I go to bed at, like, between 9.30 and 10. I stop eating around, usually around, like, 7, 7.30. Okay, so I would just really not drink a whole lot of fluids in, like, the one to two hours before bed. What about my chamomile tea? before bed Mm, 
chamomile. I love chamomile. Chamomile. <laughs> um, so is that just a, is that eight ounces about or? Yeah, it's probably six to six to eight ounces. Okay. Um, have it, have it with dinner. Yeah. It'll support digestion too. Mm. But will I get really tired right after dinner? No. No. no especially not with something like chamomile. Especially not with chamomile tea. Mm. Um, it's a very gentle way of taking herbal of consuming herbal medicine. Mm. So drink it with uh, with dinner. That's great. Okay. Yeah. And then okay. report back to me. But okay. I definitely would not worry about feeling sleepy yeah. uh, from that. And mm. then really just try to like limit consumption of fluids for okay. the hour, at least for the hour before bed. So let's say yeah. you're getting into bed by 930, you said. So 830, I would just plan on like, again, if you're thirsty, take a little sip of water, mm -hmm. but not drink a whole cup of a whole glass of water before mm. before bed. Okay. Because, yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, whatever bodies be bodies and sure <laughs> sometimes you just drink a little bit more before bed but preferably we're not getting up in in the middle of the night because for some people too that really just it keeps them awake for a little while yeah because my brain just immediately starts thinking about what i get what i gotta do the next day and things Sounds like, like that some nervous system support yeah i <laughs> for sure yeah um i recently started journaling in the evening mm -hmm. and that at least gives me time to like shut my computer off put my like i i, I don't sleep my phone's not even in my room um right. i good. use a watch alarm which wakes me up but just having that time to like let my brain unwind a little bit mm -hmm. could i do more than like 15 to 20 minutes before i go to bed absolutely um but yeah no that's, that's great though that's better than nothing baby steps, baby I, steps. I think that's <laughs> and i think that's important for people to realize right like it's like Five minutes is better than one minute, you mm -hmm. know. Ten minutes is better than five, and you, and you keep getting a little bit better there. Um, so we okay, got sleep. 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 Yeah, yep. I was like, we keep like going <laughs> off into other tangents. Well, there's a, there's a million different so rabbit good. holes. Um, okay, so sleep. Uh, again, these things go for both women and men. Um, and then you said food, nutrition. Yep, nutrition. So, and the the question was rem rem jog my memory. So we're just like talking about. Just what helps optimizing testosterone levels, raising testosterone levels, because mm -hmm. I think most people don't have no idea where their testosterone levels are roughly. And I know it can change based on the day and the season of life that you're in or whatever else it is. Most people don't really know. But like one, are there certain I guess that's, an, that's another rabbit hole is like, are there certain things that if you're feeling that like that could be a sign that your testosterone is low? Mm hmm. Oh, wait, is that another question on top of... I guess... <laughs> I don't want to overwhelm you with questions. Tom, but, you're giving me like but 20 questions. I'm giving, I'm giving you so many questions. Um, I apologize. But I think for the person who maybe hasn't gotten their blood work done mm -hmm. um, and they don't know what their testosterone levels are, yeah. like, what are the signs that people should look for? Like, oh, if, if X, Y, and Z mm -hmm. are, like, good in your biofeedback, then like your testosterone levels are probably fine. Or if yeah. like this, this, this are happening, then your testosterone is probably low. Yes. I guess that's like a precursor mm -hmm. to then like how food, we talked about some of the lifestyle things, but then how like food mm -hmm. and herbalism can also contribute to healthy hormones mm -hmm. and testosterone. Yeah. Well, I will say like the, the biggest one is the just fatigue and the moodiness, especially as testosterone starts to decrease and estrogen starts to increase um, in the hopes that, you know, that estrogen is converted into testosterone. But when you're having higher levels, first of all, it's just a different type of testosterone, you know, and, and having any sort of higher levels of estrogen as a male is going to, uh, I forget exactly how Soul brought, he phrased it in a way that I was like, yeah, that's, that was a good way to phrase it. But just more moody, more um, emotional. Um, not that men shouldn't be emotional. We should, that you should be, please do. Uh, but the way that they are able to like actually show up and to like strategically think mm. about certain things that are making them feel emotional, it, it just changes. Right. Um, but I would like to also ask you as someone who you said, you know, you've struggled with lower testosterone. How does that feel as a man experiencing the lower testosterone? Yeah, so one is you're, you're not sleeping well. Mm. You're not sleeping well. You wake up feeling tired, fatigued, groggy, yeah. mentally foggy, groggy. Your hunger cues are thrown off. Mm -hmm. You don't 
have a lot of motivation or energy to do things. You don't really want to be social. Um, right, because it's it's your zest hormone. Yeah, it's your zest for life. It's like you just feel kind of like get stuff done. You just feel kind of dull. Mm-hmm. That's the best way to put it. Yeah, and a lot of women say that same exact thing pretty much when our estrogen and progesterone are low, and it's like anxious. Did you feel anxious when your testosterone is low? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So because and you asked me this earlier, I don't know if I. Uh, I, know, I keep throwing questions. questions. I keep throwing questions at you. I apologize. Them, though, like randomly, I'm like, let's go back <laughs> to whenever you asked me that. But like, what are hormones? Like, why are they important? Yeah, they're chemical messengers, and they're part of nearly every physiological process of the body. So they're really important. Um, and again, for both women and men, uh, we have you know, like women, we do have testosterone, but to much lesser amounts, and it's really the production of it's very secluded. Uh, to specifically ovulation but our hormones are again they play a role in everything from our metabolism to our immunity to the shine of our hair the shine of our skin our nervous system our emotions they play a a really important role in in so much in how we show up in the world and how we perceive things that are going on in our world so that's why they're very important and I just wanted to go back to that because I was like, we didn't even answer that. No, that's 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 important. That's important. <laughs> we didn't answer that. And we're talking so much about <laughs> hormones and and testing and, and food and all these things. And it's like, but why should we even care? Yeah, and it's like matter. everything that you just said, like who wants to feel that way? In fact, majority of Americans do, uh, first of all, have sleep struggles. Also, I didn't even add that. That was one of the things. Add that to the list when I was younger. I was literally part of like sleep study trials and I was sleeping in sleep clinics there for a while because I was insomniac. That was more so due to birth control that I was on, which was impacting my nervous system, impacting my brain. And literally I stopped hormonal birth control and within a week I was sleeping again. So that was fun. Um, But most Americans are struggling with everything that you just said, both women and men alike. The waking up feeling, no matter how much you've slept the night before, like waking up foggy, brain foggy, and you're just, you just feel dull. You feel like a mummy, you know, if you don't have higher, if you don't have healthy, adequate levels of testosterone for men and healthy, a healthy ratio between estrogen and progesterone for Mm. women, you feel like a mummy walking through life. Mm. So that's why they're important. And so nutrition. (laughs) So really just like nutrition, I think that we way over complicate nutrition. I'm actually going, starting back up school on Thursday to get my master's of science in human clinical nutrition because I know a lot about nutrition. But going back to what I said earlier, so many people are out there talking about nutrition and have absolutely no like expertise to do so. Mm. And I just, I think we're over complicating it. And I'm like, I'm going to test my theory and I'm going to go back to school for this <laughs> and really complicate it for a little bit to be able to break out of that noise and um, have like a more well-grounded like uh, foundation when it comes to nutrition. But as I see it now and as I've seen it for a really long time, I think we really overcomplicate it, especially grocery stores help with that overcomplication and all these different CPG brands that we have of like, here's this healthy cereal and here's this healthy cookie. And like there are all these options now. Uh, thanks to grocery stores. And don't get me wrong. It's really convenient to have a grocery store to be able to go and pick up, you know, your your produce from and your fish and your meats, etc. Um, for anyone living in Austin, I oh, always get so weary of sharing this because I'm like, it's so small and there's only so much meat to be shared. But there's enough meat to go around. But there is a regenerative <laughs> farmer's truck like four or so different farmers have come together and they have a South Austin location and a North Austin location now. And they, I mean, you can get your eggs there. You can get your raw milk there. If that's your jam, you can get uh, bones for bone broth. They also have bone broth already there. All of your chicken, your red meats, um, everything is there. And it's awesome. And then some other local businesses have come in that are not uh, protein animal focused, but are um, like there's this awesome lady who does like gluten-free sourdough and she drops it off every Friday and there's a local raw honey company. So it's amazing yeah, down here. It, it really is. is. <laughs> We're, I'm very grateful because I've worked with people from all over the country and all over the world who don't have that same access. You don't even have a Whole Foods near them. But honestly, a lot of those people do live in farming towns. And so I'm like, go find your local farmer and, you know, it's honestly even better for them because there's less like noise when it comes to like walking around a place like Whole Foods and you're like, whoa, look at all this like 
different like colorful branding packaged boxed food you know and uh it's really just more simple like you it can get a lot more simple than that especially if you're living in a farming town so i say like go to the source as much as possible i'm definitely not one i I i've never been this way maybe this will change in the future but i i would love to eat seasonally but i don't think that's really possible for everyone especially if you're living in a city it's Mm. like just just eat real food you know like again people overcomplicating it because like this group of people says eat seasonally this people says eat based off of your blood type and then this group is like no you should just be carnivore and so (laughs) there's like all this noise and i'm like how about we just all agree that let's eat real food you know like if you want to have a like one of those healthy cpg brands like the gluten-free dairy-free sugar-free like cookies or whatever like every once in a while sure but like it shouldn't be a part of our our like daily way of eating and really just getting like super simple with things so um when it comes to nutrition i just say like don't overcomplicate it and for men because the common uh narrative is like skip breakfast and fast i would challenge that a little bit and say that number one you don't need to do that if you don't want to and arguably you shouldn't do that either i don't understand why you would want to do that um because eating a wholesome nutritious breakfast especially if you're hoping to like put on muscle and to um number one just have like healthy muscles healthy tissues healthy brain to support your cognitive function Mm. it's like instead of spiking your blood glucose by just drinking caffeine on an empty stomach how would you eat a satiating breakfast and see how your cognitive performance is then you know yeah before we move on i just want to like pin right there i had no idea that drinking caffeine on an empty stomach was going had an effect on testosterone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's one of my least favorite practices that people do in the wellness space. I've had so many women come into me with uh, thyroid issues, and they didn't see see any, you know, or receive any support or see any improvement with what their doctor told them to do, because usually the doctor is like, "Well, your thyroid's struggling. Here's thyroid medication." And I have seen so many women who are struggling with their thyroid, and I again go through the checklist like, "How are you sleeping? How stress? Nutrition?" And all of those women, I t- I'm literally not kidding, every single woman that I've seen with thyroid struggles was skipping breakfast mm. because she heard from some podcaster or some person on social media who read a research study that was like intermittent fasting can be really great. And as humans, especially as Westerners, we like to really take things to the extreme. So it's like, yeah, intermittent fasting is great, but... Intermittent fasting, that's what we call it now, circadian fasting has been around and fasting in general has been around for a really long time. Humans have always taken a break from eating. We weren't just like eating all the time, you know, and um, like with any fad diet or health trend, it's like it's all marketing that goes behind it. Um, And a lot of the research studies are funded by people who and companies who want to make products for intermittent fasting or, or promote that in some way and make money off of it. But circadian fasting is like, yeah, let's take a break from eating overnight. (laughs) You know, like humans, when it was dark, we would stop eating. Um, And so obviously that changes with, you know, the seasons a little bit um, because sometimes it gets dark by like 4 p.m. depending on where you live and you want to have dinner a little bit later than that. But really it's like, how about we go 12 to 14, 16 hours overnight while we're able to actually reap the benefits of fasting because right once you wake up and you are working out or you're sitting in the car in traffic getting to work or you're actually working like all of these things our body and brain's preferred source of fuel is glucose so it's going to get it preferably from the food that you eat because that is like the least energy requiring stressful process on the body is just extracted from the foods that we're eating like healthy wholesome foods otherwise it's just going to get it from our liver like we store glycogen so we're going to just get it from our body no matter what so that's why i just i'm pro eating breakfast um i'm not anti-caffeine i think that people overdo it for sure i'm more of like a one cup of matcha a day type person not like a espresso morning midday and night I don't think I'll ever be that way because I just wouldn't sleep. But uh, just, you know, you can still drink caffeine, but just don't drink it on an empty stomach. Mm. Drink it with breakfast. Drink it right after breakfast. Um, And again, like when it gets into like your exact breakfast, I would just say just do what works best for you. If it is raw eggs and nine raw eggs, like go for it, you know. Shout out Soul Bra. (laughs) 
<laughs> if it's raw eggs, like do it. If it's cooked eggs, go yeah. for it, you know? Um, so see what works best for you. Like people love to demonize things. They're lo people love to have like the latest health trend, you know? And it's mm -hmm. like uh, the intermittent fasting thing just also annoyed me. Cause I was like, people, we've been fasting as humans for since the beginning of time, you know, this isn't anything new, like intermittent fasting is not like this new thing, but again, we just took it way too far. We we're like, okay, how about instead of just fasting overnight, we fast through like the next night. <laughs> it's like, but why? <laughs> and don't get me wrong. I think fasting can be brilliant if you are struggling with like um, an acute illness mm -hmm. and you are trying to recover then fasting. But when you read ancient and just, you know, it just has to be ancient, but like the the medical literature throughout his, like human history of fasting, it was done in a way where you, so let's say you're sick. Fasting is a part of the protocol for that. You're pretty much laying down and you're being monitored in your fasting, you know, but we don't really allow ourselves that time and that grace to just take a step back and lay and have like an emotional, physical, spiritual rest. We're like, okay, we're going to fast and still go to the gym and work out. We're just going to live our life normally, but we're not going to give ourselves any fuel. <laughs> it's like, but why? We need fuel to, to survive. So if you want to fast for a more like medical purpose, then do it in the way that it was intended and actually rest, which is why I love to fast overnight. Again, that's natural for the body because number one, it supports melatonin production. When we are eating it's going to naturally increase our cortisol because you know cortisol in the acute term is not a bad thing it's actually a very healthy physiological response and it's going to help with the digestion of the food that we're eating um but this is why uh, one of the reasons why we want to move dinner a little bit earlier so then we're not focusing our energy on digesting food and assimilating those nutrients we're actually producing melatonin mm. which will support our sleep it also will support our brain and neural health. It, melatonin is one of the most powerful antioxidants. It's not just for sleep. So it's very, very powerful. And uh, to support detoxification processes that happen naturally overnight. Again, our bodies really cycle like on the circadian clock and rhythm. And to support all of the processes that happen while we sleep. Number one, we need to be asleep. So get into bed and actually sleep. Um, but again, it, to to move the eating window up a little bit by three or four hours before bed so you're not focusing and diverting energy to that process of the body. You're focusing it on cellular metabolism and rejuvenation and detoxification, et cetera. Um, and then you eat in the morning. You eat at breakfast, you know? It doesn't have to be right away. I'm not saying you have to, like, wake up, roll out of bed, and, like, chug some egg yolks. But, uh, <laughs> you know, eating within, like, an hour of waking up, you know? Especially if you're going to be like getting up and getting after it and going to the gym, make a smoothie. One of my favorite, actually, any guys listening to this, go check out Dr. Stephen Cabral. He is a really smart, balanced, naturopathic doctor and a man. And he'll, he'll actually be on my podcast for the second time in a few weeks. But he talks all the time about he like drinks smoothies like because he's kind of more, you know, that masculine energy. Like, let's get it. Like he owns his like one of the biggest I think the biggest naturopathic clinic in in Boston and he also like writes books and he has the supplements like he's doing a lot and he released a podcast every single day I'm like how do you do that <laughs> on top of everything and he's a father so he definitely has that like get up go get it energy but he's not like fasting in fact he's actually very anti the the extended fasting when it's not done in a a more like a medical way um, and he'll drink like his smoothies while he goes to the gym and lifts his weights. So that's nice too, because a lot of people don't, especially if you don't eat breakfast right now, it's going to be hard for you to right away start eating like a big breakfast. And maybe that's just not what you want to do. And maybe that's not what you have time for. So making a smoothie that you can sip on in between reps is a great way to eat breakfast, to get nutrients in. Mm. Or you could just go watch our collab that's now posted on our smoothie that we made, that which is fire. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we got lifestyle stuff. We've so got food stuff. Um, herbalism. <laughs> How is that the cherry on top to optimizing hormone production? Yeah, so there are a few different things I would talk about. Um, uh, first, I want to talk about some more like just uh, like micronutrients. Zinc, 
directly supports testosterone health and production and it also supports our gut health and our immunity so i would say zinc um getting like a, a very bioabsorbable form so like zinc picolinate is a great um way to really absorb that um i love shilajit as well are you familiar with shilajit? Uh, i take it every day okay, okay. i take it every day um, so shilajit is this awesome uh resin tastes really and, good oh i was like are you kidding <laughs> no. It does not taste good. It tastes awful. What my roommate showed me is you. I, I will put it in my coffee, and I'll put oh. it on the frother. So you take it, and you put it on the frother. Okay. And then you froth for, like, a minute, and you move it all around, and it masks the flavor because it is pretty bad. You see, I'm not a coffee fan, so okay. for me, that just sounds like a double whammy of just, like, terrible tasting Fair enough. Fair enough. But for my coffee drinkers out there, if you like coffee, Shilajit. Shilajit. Sometimes things that are really healthy for you just don't taste the best, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, but um, suck it up. Shilajit is great. <laughs> um, Shilajit is really great. Saw palmetto, which we put into our smoothie recipe that's dropping today on the gram, is really great for prostate health. Um, also, I just want to say, like, men really prioritize your prostate health. It doesn't sound sexy but like it is it, it needs to be it needs to be focused on a lot um i know a lot of men in their 50s and 60s right now who are undergoing prostate cancer treatment and it's just important like mm. it's really it's really important to talk about men's health and women's health um i think you know again we're in this new age where we're talking more about these things, we have social media. For better or for worse, we get ex a lot more exposure to information. Not every bit of information is worth listening to, but we are we're talking about these things now, and it's important to take care of men's health. Um, I have again a lot of men in my life who just I've I've never seen them throughout my entire life care about their health, and it's just something that we should really be prioritizing a lot. Um, cause women on average live longer and it's like, well, clearly then, even though we are high stress too, clearly we're doing something right. And we do, we are usually the ones like statistically speaking that are, um, the purchasers and consumers of herbal medicine and supplements. And we're the one who will go see the, the naturopath and the midwife and get our yearly checkups. Um, so get your checkups. It doesn't have to be with a traditional medical doctor if that's not your jam. Um, but get your checkups for sure. Um, what else do I want to talk about? I want to talk about, uh, okay, so I want to talk about ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is one of my most favorite herbs. I'm releasing an entire podcast episode on ashwagandha in, well, it's probably already released by the time this podcast episode <laughs> will be released. So just go listen to it. Um, but ashwagandha is really great for libido. It's really great for the nervous system as well. Ashwagandha, literally, like I spent 30 minutes just talking about all of the different health benefits of it. And it supports, um, again, the nervous system, which will then support our hormone health and fertility as well. I think all of us could use a a dose of um, some nervous system regulators. And it's an adaptogen. So it has a very non-specific action on the body and it's just going to go in and and really clean house and do what it needs to do it's a powerful antioxidant a powerful anti-inflammatory also like anti-tumor um it's i'm trying to like remember like all of the many things that it is but for men's health specifically it really does support fertility it what supports brain health as well um helps with the prevention of like alzheimer's mm. and dementia which are two very prominent diseases in western society so i love ashwagandha i love ginger as well <clears throat> ginger is very anti-inflammatory and it's a circulatory herb so and, and many other things also a carminative herb so uh i was joking about in my latest podcast episode about herbal aphrodisiacs that uh, <laughs> be careful with the carminative herbs because um you know something like ginger for example that helps to increase circulation which is really great for the body it's great for our heart it's great for our reproductive organs getting circulation to prostate uterus ovaries like etc like moving uh, and getting circulation within the body um but the carminative herbs you may not want to take those before like getting it on because they help to expel gas from the mm. body so maybe give yourself a little bit of time between taking that herb and then uh and getting it on um uh but turmeric is another one i just love to put turmeric on any food that it makes sense to put on every single day I really that's one of turmeric and ceylon cinnamon are two of the herbs that i try to just incorporate on food because i, I 
do love to work with herbs. My favorite way to consume herbs, I'll just say this because I haven't said it yet, um, is our tinctures. So macerations, extracting the medicinal properties of the roots, the barks, the rhizomes, the berries, the leaves, whatever whatever part of the plant that we're using and extracting that through a maceration process using uh, organic sugarcane ethanol, which is alcohol, and a little bit of glycerin and then water for depending. It just depends on what plant you're using and what parts. That's my favorite. Taking it tincture wise, it's just like the most potent medicinal, but I love drinking herbal tea. You just have to drink a little bit more of it if you're trying to elicit a more medicinal effect. But I drink herbal tea like three to four cups every single day of different herbs. I work with different herbs every week. Um, and then there are herbal baths. There are sprinkling herbs and spices on your food. Which what, do you go through, what are your go-to teas? My go-to teas? So I love spearmint and I love mm. nettles as well. Nettles is a nutritive herb. So I just feel like when I drink nettles, I just feel and perform a lot better. And um, it's also antihistamine, which is really great because... I love avocados and some more higher histamine foods. And so it helps to kind of neutralize that a little bit because I just, um, avocados are just my favorite. Uh, and sometimes I do get a little phlegm so in the good. back of my throat afterwards. I'm like, this is a little bit of a reaction to it, but <laughs> we love it. We love it so much. Um, and then spearmint specifically for women and regulating androgen production. Uh, so my lady is listening to this who have PCOS or androgen uh, sensitivity just higher levels of androgens, then spearmint is a really great one for that. Um, so those two are my go-to right now. I mean, I just like, I'll make a big batch overnight and I'll drink it all throughout the next day. And then I do love like a chamomile lavender blend if I'm drinking tea in the evening hours because that's just really calming. Um, and so I'll stick with those. Those ones are my favorite. I do love yerba mate, but I will only drink that exclusively in the morning. And that's if I'm not drinking like matcha or another form of, of caffeine because it's very energizing. But I do love yerba mate. And I've been experimenting with that one a little bit just to see like how I feel on the days that I do drink it and when I don't drink it, etc. Um, so turmeric ginger um ceylon cinnamon which we put into our smoothie as well that regulates blood sugar and it's very anti-inflammatory so when it comes to like supporting one specific thing so in this case men's hormones male testosterone and uh like sperm quality and sperm motility it's really just like okay take this one specific thing because it's going to have this one specific action uh really we want to look at it from like a holistic picture we want to first ask like what is the root cause of your lower testosterone? And let's work off of that. So is it inflammation? Mm. Probably. Most people are struggling with inflammation. Inflammation is like usually the root of all things. Um, but why are you inflamed? First, let's clean that up. Is it is it diet? Is it stress? Is it lack of sleep? Um, so we clean that up first, like what's actually causing the inflammation and then what type of herbs can we do to reduce inflammation? And um, sometimes a circulatory issue, especially when it comes to sperm motility, increasing circulation. Mm. And we can use herbs that are very, very powerful for that, uh, both topically and internally. I'm more of a fan of like uh, internally taking herbs, though. Um, and it, yeah, so there are so many things, right? And then you do have the specific herbs that do help to increase healthy levels of testosterone and to support the the quality and the volume of sperm and to help with sperm motility because infertility is a huge issue that is being experienced by both men and women alike. And um, again, aside from like all of the, the lifestyle and the nutritional things that we can be doing, there are some really great herbs that you can help that can help with that. Um, and going back to ashwagandha again, because I love ashwagandha so much, ashwagandha works in so many different ways, but it really like how it, how it helps fertility specifically is by reducing the stress response because the more that we can regulate our stress response stress response and support our stress resiliency our body and our mind's ability to actually cope with stress because stress is inevitable in all different forms mental emotional and physical stress it's it's inevitable but if we can actually be more resilient to all of that and we can actually build up the systems of our body then we can lower inflammation 
and we can support the production of our hormones. And also we'll probably just feel more in the mood to actually, especially for my men and women listening to us who want to have a baby, feel more in the mood to actually have sex to then create said baby, you yeah. know? Um, so it's a really holistic approach when it comes to women's hormones, when it comes to men's hormones. It's not just like, here's one pill or here's one supplement or one herb that can help you with that. It's like, well, first of all, why is it happening? Like whatever is going on, why is that happening? And then it's nutrition. It is sleep. It is stress reduction. It's herbalism, herbal medicine, and sometimes supplements too, because I, I do take supplements and I know not everyone is a fan of them, but number one, you just have to make sure you're choosing high quality supplements and herbs too. Like make sure that you're choosing organic and or just wildcrafted because some herbs can't be organic. They're wildcrafted, but make sure you're choosing quality supplements and that there are no other weird ingredients in those supplements that may have a bad effect on, on you. Um, but, um, anyway, herbalism supplements because supplements specifically especially like a a mineral supplement or a micronutrient vitamin and mineral supplement i eat very healthy and i try to go i mean number one always organic um always organic going local for our eggs and our meats and and any animal stuff but it's still just hard to get all of the nutrients that you need especially being a stressed society where we're using up all of those minerals um and we're just like dumping minerals and vitamins when we're stressed we sometimes can't keep up with nutrition alone so i i am actually for using whether it's you know shilajit or you're getting um a multivitamin mineral supplement like just supplementing as needed and sometimes that doesn't work for every single person because Especially when it comes to minerals, that's a whole other conversation and how they, you know, balance each other out. You don't want too much of one because it can decrease one, another, and et cetera. Um, but for anyone who's, like, interested in doing some lab testing around your minerals and your ratios, you could do the hair tissue mineral analysis test. And then you can supplement specifically with what you are deficient in mm. um, for, you know, three to six sometimes even 12 months, and then maybe moving towards a multivitamin for maintenance. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's another conversation for another time about like minerals and, and supplementation. Um, but I don't even remember what your initial question was. I feel like I've just gone on a rant. No, I feel you've, you know, you've, you've come, you, 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 you nailed it. It was, uh, it was wrapping up like what are, how does herbalism support testosterone? And mm -hmm. you gave us that and so much more. And, I mean, there's a million different rabbit holes that we could continue to go down, but yeah. I think that was so much good information. And, you know, I'm walking away from this like, okay, there's so many actionable steps that I can take to optimize my hormones with the purpose of just living as the best version of me. Mm -hmm. And when you're the best version of yourself, that you can continue to show up for others. So I appreciate all the work that you're doing, all of the knowledge and insight and, you know, wisdom vulnerability that you brought today and i'm just so grateful that you're doing the work that you're doing because there's purpose behind it it's not just to you know show other people you know all of your amazing products and this that and the other but like you're you know i can tell that you're doing it for the betterment of society so i appreciate all that you're doing thank you one last thing i want to say because yeah. there's so much to say and like you know obviously a lot of what we talk about, we just kind of brush over and For sure. longer conversations could be had on all of it. But everyone should be supporting their liver every single day. Supporting your liver That's health it. is huge. Um, I have a liver supportive tincture. So really, you're just looking for hepatic herbs, meaning relating and supportive of the liver. There's a massive group of herbs that fall under mm. this category. So um, drinking them in tea form is really great. But if you want to take a more medicinal, I highly recommend getting an herbal tincture for that. And then there are other um, there are other supplements that you could take in NAC and things mm. for your liver health. But uh, why I love herbs so much and why I think everyone should be taking herbs is because they're so powerful yet gentle on the body. Mm. And they're not, again, generally speaking, they come with very little risk. So it's like, why not just include them? I mean, humans have been working with plants and, and eating plants and making medicines out of plants for thousands of years. So there's a reason that 
they're still around. They've truly stood the test of time and have been used by millions of different practitioners. They've been prescribed by millions of practitioners and actually taken by millions of human bodies. So just explore herbs. And for men, because my I have a, a specific tincture for women's hormone health and fertility, and then my other two tinctures, one for sleep, one for, for liver health and digestive health, those one can be for men as well. Um, but I would just say like, there's definitely, I would hope so another brand that's like mine, but more so for men's health. So Dr. Morse is a really great herbal brand that I like, and they have a ton of different herbal formulas. So I would just go an herb farm. So Dr. Morse and herb farm, um, have a prostate health tincture. And again, maybe you've never considered taking care of your prostate health, but doesn't matter what age you are, just really like start prioritizing that. And there are some really great herbs to support that. And they have really great tinctures. So again, that's Herb Farm, Farm, P-H-A-R-M, like pharmacy. So Herb Farm and Dr. Morse have those prostate and men's health uh, tinctures. Amazing. And get your herbs from Herbalist because I'm not a huge fan of taking uh, singular herbs in tincture Mm. form. I think that herbs, again, work better together. Sure. Um, So I would would do more of like a formula. Okay. Mm -hmm. And... If people want to support you and check out any of your stuff, buy some of your tinctures, where can they do that? PeaceLoveHormones.com. Amazing. And before I let you go, I do have to ask you the last question. This is the Pure Ambition podcast. When you hear those two words together, Pure Ambition, what comes to mind? What does it mean to you? And how does that apply to your daily life? I always get thrown these these <laughs> questions and I'm like, oh gosh. Okay. Um making you think. Pure ambition, I think of personally the businesses that I'm building. I'm building a second business right now that's mastic chewing gum with my partner Braxton, Braxton's brother, Zach, um, and then my brother, uh, Tom. So it's a family business and it's really fun to play. It's because mastic chewing gums comes from the, the mastic tree. And uh, it's herbalism. falls under herbalism. So it's very fun to constantly support people and also to bring uh, this specifically is, is native to Greece and the Mediterranean region. And not a lot of people know about it in the United States. So it's always fun to expose these wonderful, powerful herbs to people who, you know, again, could really benefit from it, but just had no idea it existed. So for me, pure ambition is like growing, not even just growing businesses, but like growing overall herbal knowledge and bringing herbalism. And this isn't just me. I'm not, I'm not like taking all the credit for bringing herbalism <laughs> back over and making it more mainstream. But I do, I, I feel part of the mission the renaissance so to say of making it more normal again because it used to just be a part of everyone's life as humans and we've really moved away from that so especially like the younger generations i want to make it cool for us you know um because i think most people when they think of herbalist they think of like an older lady like in a very like chinese witch doctor yeah <laughs> like you know with all and it's um beautiful i did a i studied under a lot of people like that and i really really respect our herbal elders um but i also want to be a part of the the group and the mission that's bringing that to like the younger generations and making that fun and cool love it you know so that's what pure ambition means to me it's just like spreading health and love because in order for us to be kind empathetic high achieving wonderful human beings we need to be healthy first Mm. So that's my mission, is to help people get healthier. That's so good. Maddie Miles, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for all the work that you do. We'll have all of your stuff listed in the show notes. I appreciate you. And best of luck with all that you got going on. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode. I wanted to give you all a heads up too that I launched a free community on the Upspace app where you can join, ask me questions, connect with like-minded individuals, follow my four-week running and strength training program that has some dedicated mobility sessions in there as well so that we can all optimize our health and fitness together. So if you're interested, head over to the App Store, download the Upspace app, and join the Pure Ambition community today. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.